by a milman carry an outer door, an outer door to uh, where the, the scholars that uh, produced one of the main uh, revolutions or, or paradigm shifts in in the modern humanism of the century, with their study of both Homer and epics in the Serbo-Croatian language, and their field work in the 30s and the 50s more. Wow, okay, I'm not going to ask anybody. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should play this just for a few seconds so that they know what they're facing in case they want to change panel. Okay, so. So, Abdul Medjedovic is the Serbo Croatian poet. He was able to produce uh, epics uh, that were consistent and coherent and extremely fascinating, and that were longer than 12,000 miles, and so the size of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And as I said, this was recorded in Bosnia and Herzegovina, near here, in the 1930s. And uh, this is a panel about oral poetic discourse, as you are going to see in a minute. It is quite an exotic thing in a discourse analysis conference, or a literary conference, or a linguistics conference, or any conference that is not done on poetic studies. So we thought that you might use a short introduction before I give you the real oral poetic scholars from uh, Belgrade and Novisad, uh, Lydia and Ravi sitting here. So, very quickly, let me give you some facts about oral poetry. It's probably the oldest form of public discourse. It, it comes directly from a uh, ritual, which is probably the first one. And, and we, we find it all over the place, and we don't have any reason to think that uh, there has been a culture that didn't have it. For over 90% of the history of the species, since more or less the upper Paleolithic, 50,000, 80,000 years ago, depending on, on which school you follow, we have cognitively modern human beings. And for almost all history of the species, it, it was the only verbal art uh, available because the technology of writing uh, simply had not been invented. It is still the main verbal art for over half of the world's population today who are just barely literate uh, and, uh, and uh, are not able to uh, compose or follow poetry in the written form. Although written culture surrounds us and we're very used to it, it is not exactly the natural thing. And because it is multiform, it takes many forms, and it is extremely rich, uh, these guys produce and produce and produce, and every performance is unique, although it, it also has common patterns, but it's also unique. It still goes, it still constitutes the vast majority of the poetry or, or, or the verbal art produced right now in the world as we speak. And very few people study it. Uh, practically 99% of the material of literary studies in any literary studies department, in any linguistics department, even, is about written texts <coughs> composed in a literary, in a literary way in, in the literary culture. So we simply think that this is out of balance and that it, it should be changed. So the way this thing started, and, and I will give you just a short introduction <coughs> and, and then we move on to the papers. Uh, was uh, because Melvin Perry, uh, who was doing his PhD at the Sorbonne, uh, wanted to solve the mystery of Homer, which is the big mystery, not only of classical studies or of Greek literature, but probably of the history of literature and culture, and culture in general. Uh, Homer is, uh, in chronological terms, the first text that we have from the Greeks. We have a few very short inscriptions that might be a little older, because dating Homer is not that easy. But Homer is quite surely from somewhere in the second half of the 8th century before Christ. And the alphabet was probably, quite probably, not introduced before the 
the early 8th century before Christ. So uh, this is like, like you study Spanish culture and the first text you find is an show. Or the first thing you find is Shakespeare when you're studying English. It's absolutely uh, unprecedented. It doesn't happen in any other culture. The Iliad and the Odyssey are two monuments, two literary monuments. They're extremely rich and, and top quality in classical works of literature. They have educated generation after generation, not only of the Greeks, but also of other peoples. And we simply don't know exactly where they came from, who was Homer, how they were composed, because all we have are little hints. We, these questions were being asked at the time of Barry, was there one Homer, uh, how were these works composed, uh, how were they written down? Because it was clear that in one degree or another, there was an oral tradition behind them, even simply because of the fact that there was no writing available shortly before Homer, and they cannot simply pop out like that. Uh, the person who wrote the poems, the scribe, was he a doctor? He, was he the one uh, finally responsible for versifying the story? Who the hell was Homer? And how does a poetic tradition begin? Is what we're asking here, because uh, the oral tradition gets written down, or uh, the oral tradition gives birth to a written tradition. That's uh, that's the way a poetic tradition begins. The Greek literary tradition is probably the one that has been most influential uh, in Western culture, and we simply don't know how it started. So this is what gives a great importance to the work that Newman Perry and Albert Bloom did with Homer and the Regional Southern Bards. This is the breakthrough, the breakthrough breaking into, into uh, different steps. So Perry uh, first accomplished uh, an, a, a, an statistic breakthrough. He uh, did perform a, a, a statistic analysis of the Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, for his doctoral dissertation and found that practically every line of the poem is composed and, and demonstrated that every line of the poem uh, is composed by chunks, half line, a third of line, or even a whole line uh, that are repeated literally verbatim elsewhere in the poems or that are repeated elsewhere with very slight uh, formal variations, but for certain very schematic. Uh, then came the idea that uh, Harry put forward. The reason for this is because the formulaic nature of the Homeric poems is a resource of the oral singer who needs to compose his poetry in a different way to which we're used to. He needs to compose as he is singing to his audience. He needs to compose in performance. This was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, everybody was throwing the stones at Perry, uh, but somebody at Harvard University where he was uh, had the courage to support him and with his student Lord, they came to the Balkans seeking living oral traditions uh, after uh, several trials. Uh, they ended up in Bosnia, Herzegovina, with uh, several uh, hundred kilograms of recording equipment of the 1930s. And in a wonderful heroic fashion, recorded hundreds and hundreds of performances of different singers, which then wrote completely in another campaign in the 50s. And they now constitute <coughs> the uh, Milman Parry oral poetic archive at the University of Harvard, which is one of the major resources for the study of oral traditions in the world, not only uh, poetic traditions, but also musical tradition. In fact, uh, uh, many musicologists uh, and anthropologists have been uh, working there. So uh, their conclusion after the comparison was that the Iliad and the Odyssey were oral dictated texts. They were the result of dictating an oral performance, and that uh, started a new line of research and new comparative methods in oral studies. Um, 
The other uh, big concept that they put forward is the concept of the uh, theme. Uh, the theme and the formula are the, the building blocks of the oral poetic uh, story, of the oral epic that they study. So the formula are these uh, chunks that allow the singer to have a stock of formulae or idiomatic phrases that he can fit in the different uh, uh, metric and rhythmical patterns while he is composing as he performs. And the theme is uh, the building blocks that he waves into a story pattern. So they all know story patterns like the king that returns and in a known way and reveals himself. But how do you tell that tale? Well, the singer has this film in, in his mind where he knows that first he's going to have a messenger scene, and the messenger scene has this type of formulas. Then he's going to have an assembly scene, and the assembly scene has this type of formulas, etc. Et so the messenger, the assembly, the fight, the battle, all these are the themes that the singers develop throughout their careers, and uh, they use them uh, to construct their stories. So let's try to make an effort to understand this somewhat exotic concept of oral composition performance. In oral traditions, what they would parry a lord study was the oral epic in, in the form of Yugoslavia. In oral traditions, there is no fixed text and there is no memorizing for a, for, from a fixed text. These guys don't know anything by heart. This is improvisation, although this is a dangerous word. Uh, on patterns interiorized through imitation. That is to say that they learn how to use these formulas, and how to vary on them, how to create with them. They are so creative. It's a little bit like what jazz musicians do, although they are highly literal. There's no writing or systematic coaching. There's no school for oral bards involved in the process. It's a process analogous to first language or traditional second language acquisition. They follow a mentor, if, if they have one, or their father, and, and they rehearse on their own, and then when they're ready, they perform in front of peers, and etc. etc. The result is a poetic production with enhanced idiomaticity that is based on four meaning pairs that are associated to narrative, metrical, melodic, and prosodic conditions. This is to say, what, what they, the knowledge that they have is not just simply a stock of, of uh, set phrases that they can throw in. They know where to use them and how uh, to fit them in with the music. These constitute instance-based generalizations from usage. The, the, the transformational rules, as in, you know, in syntax, I know how that here comes a subject, and then a verb, and then a complement. All these transformational rules uh, are practically absent from so what uh, the people in generative linguistics like so much. They're absent from oral poetic uh, songs because the formulas are, although they are a little flexible, they're more less based. And what is learned is not the syntactic structure, but the whole chunk. The combination of these of the themes that we talked about, the messenger, the, the assembly, the battle, etc., uh, are uh, is learned in a traditional setting. It's learned as traditional discourse, and, and then they are woven into stories. And from this emerges an intersubjective and multimodal event of all the communication with all the problems and, and challenges of world communication. I am in a wedding, people are coming by, toasting, interrupting, I have to resume my tale. Uh, I know they don't, they're not really paying lots, lots of attention, so this, today I'm going to make it shorter. And then we, when we are in the coffee shop and everybody's really listening and there are good tips because it's a big celebration of Ramadan, for instance, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, then I'm going to make really long this thing and the, the messenger theme, which which for the wedding was just, there's a cloud in, in the horizon and here is the messenger. Now you're going to hear really the, the horse <laughs> galloping. There's a cloud in the horizon and there is a horse galloping and who's coming here? Is it a bird? Is it? No, it is a messenger. <laughs> right. 
and then you get a better tip. And this means that a maximum cognitive efficiency is, is needed because this is one of the most demanding performance settings in, in cognitive terms. This is like language, like everyday real communication, like what I'm doing here, only much more demanding. Because there are lots of other things at stake, there is prestige at, at stake, and you have to produce in, in, in here in reform decasyllabic, you have to produce one uh, acceptable decasyllabic line every three to six seconds while you're playing this instrument. You remember the beginning and singing the, the thing, and you you have to go sometimes for an hour or for two doing this. So people had more time in those days, no television. Yesterday I was talking about television. <laughs> okay, so now you have a little bit of an overview of, of this exotic panel. And, and now uh, let me give you the people who really know about this, who are really interact with you. Who's going to go first? I have, I have forgotten. Yeah. Oh, we said, would you guys go first in, in case we're short of time? Yeah. So Lydia Delich from the Institute of Literature for Literature and the Arts. Both great. So, are you going to do questions at the end? Um, well, this, I guess, this is a family event, so please interrupt us and ask Just a quick question then. The, the, uh, the Bosnia Hoods uh, government uh, person you showed at the beginning. Yeah. Um, did they rhyme? Did they what? Did they rhyme? Yeah. No, this, this, uh, uh, this tradition doesn't use rhyme, I think. Or do they? Uh, later. Uh, later. Uh, later. Uh, they, these are the experts. I'm, no, I'm, I'm no, just announcing. Uh, but nowadays. Now. Nowadays, in the end, in the third the end, there was no rhyme. Yes, yes, but it's not a common thing. What I know is that around the world, uh, rhyme, which is by no means a compulsory uh, phenomenon, is much more often used in lyric or poetry than in, in epic or poetry because of the length, because of the. But then you have rhyme or you have alliteration, as in Beowulf, you have lots lots of things because each tradition is different. Okay, Lydia is going to. Wow, this is later, based, but later. What is the title of your presentation? I'm refining. 